Hello everybody and welcome to my review of Star Trek Season 1 Episode 7 Nepenthe. Warning. This episode is going to be part review, part rant because I am pissed. Alright? Now, before I start, I want you to know that this review is coming from an old school Star Trek The Next Generation fan and a die-hard anxiety fan, okay? So it's going to unapologetically be filtered from this view, okay? So if you are here for a thoughtful review of the episode based on the merits of the plot and the storytelling and the acting, please come back next week, okay? Because this review right here is not the review for you, okay? So let's get it started. The episode begins with a flashback into which Commodore O and her sunglasses pays a visit to Killer Agnes at the Daystrom Institute that happens right before she um, invites herself on Picard's mission, all right? Now, during the meeting, um, Commodore O does a Vulcan mind melt on her. Okay, which confirms that she's a Vulcan because I wasn't sure if she was really a Vulcan or a Romulan pretending to be a Vulcan. Okay, so during those scenes, um, Killer Agnes is bombarded with images of death and destruction, and apparently, like, it's so dark and terrible that um, she throws up, you know. But instead of being skeptical of what she sees, you know, like an extremely educated scientist might be. <laughs> Killer Agnes just takes Commodore O and her sunglasses at their word, um, and she's quick to join her cause, right? Even um, swallowing a tracker, okay, that she knows nothing about, nothing how it works. She's just, you know, all in, right? Now, meanwhile, um, we're back on the ship. It's, um, we're back in real time. Um, and let's just get this BS, like, filler, like, story out, you know, out the way so I can get back to Mark. Rant, okay. Rafi, Rios, and Killer Agnes um, are trapped in this tractor beam by the board cube. Um, when they're let go, it's obvious that it's a trap, okay. Now, Rios feels that they can outrun them, okay. And while all this is going on, you know, Killer Agnes is having a nervous breakdown, okay. So, after they feel like they've outrun the ship. Rafi, um, despite her justified skepticism on um, why Killer Agnes keeps acting so irrational, tends to her, you know, trying to be a shoulder for her to cry on and feeding her cake, okay? So during the exchange, Killer Agnes, she gets sick and she throws up. That's, you know, what she does best, okay? And Rios takes her to sick bay. Where this fool, and yes, in this episode, he is a fool okay, has the audacity, okay, to tell Killer Agnes that he thinks that Rafi is the reason that they are being tracked, okay. He even brings up the fact that Rafi mysteriously disappeared while they were on free cloud, okay, even though Rafi told him that she went to go visit her son, okay. Now, Killer Agnes, to her credit, you know, tells Riho the fool, okay, I'm just so upset I can't even like, pronounce his name that, um, you know, that it's not her, okay? And he scoffs at this idea, like, well, who could it be? You? Like, that's impossible. It can't be you. Why is that so preposterous, okay? So it's easier for him to believe that a woman who he has known for years, okay, that he claims is a good, good, good friend, all right, who literally put Latham, go Latham and credit to whatever, in his pocket, and kept his ship and his 20,000 uh, vanity holograms going, okay, is somehow a traitor. But the thought that a woman who he didn't even know existed, okay, two weeks ago, could never betray him? Couldn't be the traitor? Why? Because he slept with you? Huh? Oh, no. Because she's... Don't you know that that's how, like, seduction, seduction 101 works? Like, go ask Narik, all right? Oh, maybe it's because she's so sweet and she's so innocent. Mm. See, at first I thought he was trying to play Killer Agnes to see, like, you know, he was on to her and to see if that she would confess, all right? But that next scene that he had with Rafi, you know, makes me think that he was really serious about that, okay? 
But before he had the opportunity, you know, to um, throw his good, good, good friend Rafi, you know, out of a, a hatch, okay? Or an airlock to protect himself, you know, and his precious killer girlfriend. Um, the oft-mentioned killer, okay, is so guilt-ridden by everything that's happening that she tries to poison herself. For what? To kill herself? To make her throw up the tracking device? Um, to make Rios even more suspicious about Rafi, because I wouldn't be surprised if he accuses Rafi of, like, poisoning the cake, all right? And earning what I hope is a much-deserved slapticism from her, okay? Anyway, she ends up in a coma, and guess what? I don't care, all right? You know who I do care about, however? I care about freaking Thaddeus Troy Riker, all right? That's who I care about, all right? Now, <laughs> that brings me to my rant, all right? Now, when we last left the card, he was on his way to um, Nephany. And please forgive me if I be putting that smart to the planet. And we have no idea who's on the planet, okay? But to on the planet, all right, is a moment 18 years and seven episodes in the making. And the main reason that I was so excited to watch Star Trek Picard, okay? And one of the reasons that my, my rants, I got two rants, okay? Rant number one is about to begin, right? Picard and Soji materialize on the planet, which is the current home planet of the Rikers, Okay. And they're greeted in the woods. They're ambushed in this cute little scene by this young girl who was pointing a bow and an arrow at them. Okay. Now, Soji is scared, but Picard quickly recognizes her and calls her Kestra, okay, which, um, you know, takes the little girl by surprise. All right. Kestra turns out to be Kestra Riker. That's right, none other than the offspring of Star Trek's beloved Mzadis, William Riker and Deanna Troy. And I have to tell you, she is perfect. She looks perfect. She acts perfect. Um, she's curious and she's bright. And I'm going to actually be doing a separate video on um, the state of the Mzadi family in a couple of days. So please be on the lookout for that because I have a lot to say about that. And I don't want that to sort of like take over like this particular episode video. All right. But I am going to be, um, you know, talking about my thoughts on Kestra, on Thad, on Will and on Deanna. Okay. So let's get, but you get a little piece of that sort of in this video. So anyway, um, Kestra takes um, Picard and Soji to her home. And um, when Picard and Deanna see each other, that scene is like pure, 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 pure magic. Um, Kestra calls out to her dad and she lets her know that John Luke Picard is there and Will kind of turns around like stunned and he doesn't believe it and then he turns around and there's Picard and he's like hello Will and just like another like magical scene and, and I want to say okay to this episode's credit or no to the actor's credit okay every scene okay that Jonathan and Patrick and Marina was with it just made me feel happy it, it just did it was like going to a family reunion that, like, you never, ever thought, like, would ever happen. Um, it's just, um, you know, amazing, okay? So Deanna, she's an empath. Don't forget she's a baby daughter. So she's an empath. So she instantly deduces that something is wrong with Picard, both um, physically and mentally. I'm not exactly sure how she deduces that she's sick, but she just does, okay? And maybe that's because she's known him for so long. Um, she sees that he's exhausted, and she um, tells him that he needs to rest in Thad's room, okay? So now my first thought is, okay, Thad's room better be available, okay? Because Thad is at Starfleet Academy, and so he has no need for his room. But somehow, the way that Troy walked to that door with trepidation, hands almost shaking, okay? I, I knew that something was wrong, okay? And something was wrong indeed, okay? As wrong as it can be, okay? That's right, everybody. Thaddeus Troy Riker, son of William T. Riker, and Deanna Troy Riker is dead. Dead, 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 okay? And I'm pissed, all right? 
killed before we even got a chance to know him. We don't even know what he looks like because there's no picture of him. You know, there's a baby picture of them, but there's no picture of him as a teen, okay? Um, and why should there be, okay? Because this legacy character, all right, was killed off as a plot device. Just as a means to let us know that nobody, nobody is going to get a happy ending in Star Trek. Okay? Sorry if you thought that was going to happen. It's not going to happen. All right? Dad died of an illness. Um, and this, this, this makes it worse. Okay? Because there's pontification involved in his death. Dad. Thad died of an illness that could have easily have been cured if it wasn't for the synthetic band, okay? So now, let me get this straight. Will Riker and Deanna Troy, who have contacts all over the galaxy, who has saved the world and the galaxy time and time again, who should have about a gazillion contacts, has no one, no one in the whole entire universe that could have helped them when that got sick. Nobody. So meanwhile, um, we learned that that was thoughtful. He was creative. He was brilliant. He created his own languages. He was just all around awesome, okay? But, but who needs him? Like, why do we need that Riker when we could fret over how bad Killer Agnes is feeling? Or behold, the wonder of twin cest, right? But we'd much rather be watching that stuff, right? Yeah, okay. Do you know, okay, how many great potential Star Trek stories that you killed off when you killed that? But I suppose you don't care because if you had cared, you wouldn't have did it in the first place. Right. <sighs> okay. So the Rikers settled on this planet when Dad got sick, okay? And it looks like a paradise. Um, but by the way that it's fortified, I get the feeling that something else is going on with the other inhabitants. Um, but, you know, we, we don't know why. We also don't know why they decided to stay after Thad died. Like, what was keeping them there, right? I mean, they live in this place. They eat from the land. You know, and I know that in The Next Generation it was established that Will liked to cook and he liked to cook fresh food and all that other kind of stuff. But um, I I'm assuming that they're still on this planet for a reason, all right? Like, maybe Thad is, like, still around in stasis or something. Like, maybe he isn't gone gone, you know? Um, one can only hope, right? Oh, <laughs> silly me. Silly me. Hope on this show? On this show? In this new Star Trek universe? Like, am I crazy? Like... But maybe, I mean, I, I don't know. Okay. <sighs> okay. Now, there is this really good subplot with Kestra and Soji, okay? Now, Kestra, the poor girl, she, like, seems to be starved for friendship. Which is another thing. Is there, like, no kids on this planet? Like, I, I just don't understand why they're raising her there. All right, but but um, she seems to take to Soji sort of like a big sister, okay? And, like, speaking of Soji, this is the best her characterization has ever, ever been, all right? And I think the thing is because she seems really young and vulnerable, and I think that instead of making her a doctor and older, they should have made her a teen character, okay? Because she seems to work better this way, okay? She does a great job at selling, um, the actress does an amazing job of selling Soji's trauma. And she's, she's really low-key about it. She kind of takes everything sort of in stride, and some people might be like, well, she should be freaking out more. But you could tell that she's in internalizing everything, which is what a lot of trauma victims do. Do. So I think she played it okay. She also has more of a natural chemistry with Kestra and Deanna than she ever did in any of those scenes with Narik, okay? Now, the scenes where um, Deanna is trying to comfort her is, are particularly really good, all right? And um, speaking of Soji, um, Will's guess that she somehow um, has some essence of data, um, it sort of came out of left field to me. <laughs> you know but whatever you know um so during the time that will and picard are talking um we learned that will tried to talk uh picard out of the romulan rescue mission because he knew um that they wouldn't be grateful which we found out a couple of episodes ago that they weren't <laughs> he also tried to talk him out of retirement 
Um, we also learned that Will is still on active duty, which I'm assuming is um, foreshadowing and that Will is going to probably show up um, in the season finale when things look its bleakest to rescue Picard. That's sort of like my guess what's going to happen. Um, okay, so then their story begins to wrap up and Picard and Soji, as that particular story wraps up, um, Picard and Soji, they beam like aboard the ship because the ship has found them um, as the Rikers look on. You know, now I, I suppose that, that I should be um, grateful, okay, that despite that they, William and Deanna are still together and they're still in love, um, you know, um, you know, they're amazing parents to Kestra, um, and I suppose that there's worse fates that could have befallen them, see how to lay in Star Wars or uh, Mulder and Scully in the X-Files. <laughs> Um, but, you know, can we have a happy ending just like in this one case? You know, haven't we as Next Generation fans earned that? Um, can we have a happy place? You know, I mean, look, part of what made Star Trek The Next Generation so special, okay, is that it was always about the best of humanity, about hope, about good triumphing, you know, over the darkness, okay? That's what I want for my next generation characters, okay? For them to at least be able to live in their world, even as they step sort of a tippy toe into this, this new one, okay? Which brings me to rant number two. Remember a few um, reviews ago when I was sympathizing with Voyager fans for the deck of um, Icheb? I hope I'm saying that right. But I didn't really feel where y'all was coming from. I feel you now. How dare you kill Hugh? Okay? How dare you kill Hugh at the, at the hands of some cartoon villainess whose only contribution to the Star Trek mythos, okay, has been rubbing up, rubbing up on her brother and making my finger twitch from wanting to fast forward through her scenes every time she's in it. Okay, I'm sick of her, and I'm sick of her brother, and hope they get blown up next week. All right? If you have to kill Q, okay, a legitimate, iconic character, why not give him a heroic death, okay? Why not have him blow up the Borg, the, the, the cube, and take those murdering XB Romulans with him, Okay? And don't even get me started, like, on that speech that he gave to Eleanor about him and Picard bringing him hope and thanking them and blah, 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 okay? Is that the, supposed to make the scene, like, more palpable to us, to you fans, to Next Generation fans? Because I'm sorry, okay, it did not work, okay? What a terrible, terrible, terrible waste, okay, of a great character, okay? Just terrible, right? So with that, um, I am going to end um, <laughs> this review slash rant um, of this episode. Um, and as usual, I will end this by asking the ultimate question. Where is Beverly? Um, but you know, after this episode, um, she's probably dead. You know, she probably got killed by the baloney virus or blown up. In the second day, you know, she made captain of her own ship or maybe she sacrificed herself to save Wesley who, you know, two years later ended up getting killed on an ill-fated Starfleet mission anyway. I mean, you know, uh, who knows, all right? So anyway, you know, great acting by Jonathan, by Patrick, by Marina, um, you know, the girl that plays Kestra, she's a superstar, loved her. Whew. But this one, for me, it, it was rough, y'all. It, it was rough. So, until next week.